The Quran doesn't speak of any sultan, any ruler, any state at the time. And I think making that distinction between what is really religious and what is what is just historical is, is crucial. Uh, we ties the idea that women should be always obedient to their husbands and never raise their voice and, and have their different opinions and, and men should be dominant. I think these are historical elements in our religious tradition that are not necessarily religious. But I believe based on the Quran, God gave us revelation, but also into a moral intuition, taqwa to every human being. And taqwa with Jiva Pakistan with my blessings and salams <laughs> to all Pakistani friends. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of the Pakistan Experience and it is an absolute honor because Mustafa Akyol is here with us. He's a Turkish writer, journalist, academic. He's currently working at the Cato's Institution in Washington, D.C. He's most well known for his books, Islam Without Extremes, A Muslim Case for Liberty and The Islamic Jesus, How the King of Jews Became a Prophet. What we've invited him for is his recent book, which is Reopening Muslim Minds, Return to Reason, Freedom and Tolerance. And he has been called probably the most notable Muslim modernists and reformers. So first of all, how are you doing, sir? Thank you so much, Shehzad. I'm good. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum to you and all. And have a good day and good night and wherever they are to everybody who's listening to us. And uh, Pakistan is a dear country for me. And uh, I'm glad that we're having this conversation on your podcast. Welcome, Aslam. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm sure we'll get into your work. But first of all, as somebody who lives in Pakistan, I'm well aware of how the country is not what it seems like on the outside. From the outside, it feels like Turkey is on the brink of economic collapse. Is that substantiated or the recent stabilization uh, there to stay or is that just temporary relief? I mean, Turkey is going through a difficult time and I think economy has went down, but still life goes on normal for most people. But uh, there was a better time that Turkey was on the path of the European Union uh, accession. It was making liberal reforms. The economy was rationally managed. Unfortunately, we moved away from that in the past several years. Uh, I still think Turkey's bright future is there, but you know, it's a bottleneck, political and economic bottleneck that we are going through. And what really has harmed the country is extreme polarization and hateful language and, uh, and, and also authoritarian politics uh, that's, that's become intensified in the past several years. Uh, fair to put a lot of that blame on Erdogan's door, which might be a concern for Pakistanis as well, because Imran Khan sort of sees Erdogan as an ideal ruler, which he would like to emulate. Well, if you were speaking about Erdogan of 10 years ago, I would say, yes, go for him. He would be an example. But things change. I mean, I should say that like I, I was a supporter of Erdogan and his party in the early years in power because they were new in power. They were doing good reforms. They were using a reconciliatory language and, and the political part of Turkish society that they represent, the Islamic conservatives, because, you know, they there was a more secular establishment in Turkey that was authoritarian in its own ways, too, like it banned the hijab. I was a very big critic of that for many years, banned the hijab in campuses, I should say, in some institutions. I was all against that, but Erdogan came with a promise of change and 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 you know uh, openness, freedom for everybody. Unfortunately, he wa- he began to retreat from that, and and that's why some of the people who began politics with Erdogan are now criticizing him and saying that this is not what we began uh, this thing together. So, uh, if you ask me, I'm I'm critical of Erdogan today. I would hope him to see lose power and you know have a new government in Turkey come to power. That may happen in the years ahead. Because I think uh, one problem in Turkey is that politics gets dominated by one side and the other side is seen as the enemy within and as are the second class citizens. And before Erdogan, it was seculars had the upper hand and the conservatives were oppressed. And now it's the other way around. Whereas I would like to see a Turkey, which is a country which gives freedom and justice to all its citizens without discriminating against them uh, based on their uh, culture, lifestyle, language and, and identity. Sounds a lot like Imran Khan. Maybe let's not get into the specific policies of Erdogan. I don't but, want to get into Pakistan politics. But, but uh, the style of governance that he does, I think it probably lends uh, itself nicely to your work as well, where you talk about how Islamic rulers almost usurped the role of the scholars and made it a part of the state. The way Erdogan is ruling Turkey, uh, to see that as 
the modern model for an Islamic state, not in the sense of ISIS, but in the sense of a modern nation state. Is it fair that without the reform that you're talking about, for good or for bad, the Erdogan model would be seen as the ideal model as far as Muslim rulers are concerned? Again, which Erdogan model? As I said in the early mm. years, it was... So the sort of quasi-dictatorship Islamic... Yeah, that's not a good model. <laughs> that's not a good model. Don't go, don't go for it. Don't fantasize about it. Uh, and of course, Turkey promotes the a culture out of this model, you know, the, I know the series Artur has become very popular in Pakistan. It's a sensation. So the glory of the Ottoman Empire. It's a great series. I'm not, uh, I have nothing against that. The, the glory of the Ottoman Empire, it, it, it's emphasized a lot. Now, I'm not against these things. And I, I myself have referred to the Ottoman Empire many times as a, uh, for its time, which was a beacon of pluralism and toleration, right? I mean, that's why Jews fled Spain and came to the Ottoman Empire to find freedom in the uh, 15th century, religious freedom. Uh, but what you, ex what you get from the Ottoman Empire is interesting, and you can get different things. And what I understand from the Ottoman Empire is the constitutionalism that developed at the last uh, phase of the empire, equal rights for all Ottomans, a pluralistic society, uh, a a, a, a law-based order that sometimes limited the sultan as well, which I emphasize in my books. Whereas what President Erdogan seems to emphasize in the Ottoman heritage is this mighty sultan that everybody has to follow. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't work. And, and when you do that, when you interfere in society, when you try to co control the whole media, when you use different legal standards for your supporters and for your critics. I mean, today... Uh, if two persons can come to the court with the same accusation, political accusations, I'm saying, if he's a pro-government, he'll be probably okay. If he's a critical of the government, he might, he, he may, she or end up in, in jail. And everybody sees this and it's not fair. So uh, I think we Muslims should understand that what really matters is not that power is at the hands of the people that we see as good people, right? People who look like us. The most important thing is that power is constrained by rule, rule of law that nobody has too much power because power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. As Lord Ackman, one of the great thinkers uh, in the Western tradition said uh, about a century ago, we see that in Turkey for, for, for sure, clearly. And there are great things about Turkey. It's still a country with secular law in the sense that, uh, you know, people who are non-Muslim are not legally discriminated against. So we don't have exactly the blasphemy laws that for example, you have in Pakistan. Although we have a blasphemy law, which is insulting the president, which is a big crime. And like more than 100, 150,000 people have been prosecuted for insulting the president. It's mind boggling. Uh, in the past uh, six, seven years, but since Erdogan came to power in 2014. So today's Turkey is not doing very well. And as a Turk, I, I think Turkey, the Turkish society deserves better than the current political atmosphere. So if my advice to Pakistani friends would be, well, there are really great things about Turkey still. I mean, uh, it's still ahead of many countries like Saudi Arabia or Iran, the Shia theocracies or, or Syria, you know, secular tyrannies. There are terrible countries in the Middle East. Compared to them, Turkey is, of course, much, much better still. But it has gone down, unfortunately, uh, quite uh, disappointingly in the past six, seven years. And the reason for that is concentration of power at the hands of one person. Whereas what we need is a political system of checks and balances, rule of law, and leaders come and go, but they don't dominate the whole society and, and they know their place, uh, which is not the case in Turkey now. Uh, it's similar things that we're fighting against in Pakistan. We do have a parliamentary democracy as compromised as, as it may be, but there is also movement towards moving towards the presidential system. And Erdogan may be a great series, but I do think it's quite problematic because in Pakistan, that's not even our history and it's presented as such. And then when we see five, six year olds uh, carrying swords and saying things like they will kill the infidels and then there are stories of non-Muslims being killed, which may, Arthur may not be to blame for that, but it's, it's, it's off-putting, it's off-settling that that's what the prime minister is suggesting everybody watches and then there's similar instances that take place but if i may talk about your work over here um so even people who are arguing for a more strict controlled power presidential system an argument that they make is the modern democracy uh is antithetical to islam 
and Islam historically has had the idea of the Sultan, even Shia philosophy or um, theology, which we, which we may think to be more progressive, has the Ayatollah as the center of the power. So the conception in Islam, or at least uh, what the mullahs in Pakistan think the conception is of that singular leader, of that Khalifa, where all power comes from, is that historically incidental or is that Islamic at its core from the start? It is true that in, in the Islamic tradition, the idea of a powerful ruler is very dominant, especially in the Sunni tradition. The Shiites just aspire for their own, but it never happened, of course, so they had their own separate track. But the powerful caliphate, and there are even teachings in, in some of the texts, uh, jurisprudential texts in Islam, even some of the hadiths that I would doubt, their authenticity I think should be open to question, about obeying the ruler if, even if he's unjust, right? Um, I don't think the Prophet Muhammad honestly said those things, but you can find those texts uh, by re illegit reports uh, from him. And I believe, uh, well, I look at the Quran, first of all. I mean, I, I mean, the Quran doesn't speak of any sultan, any ruler, any state. Uh, the Quran doesn't even speak of a caliphate. I mean, the caliphate is the most key institution here, right? The political institution. The only caliphate the Quran mentions is a authority God has given to humankind. We are vicegerents of God on earth. That's it's a metaphysical caliphate in every human being. That's not a political institution. Now, if you ask me what happened is that since Islam didn't, the Quran didn't define a political system. The, the Quran tried to give faith and morality to first Muslims, and, and they had a struggle to survive, right, in a, in a very hostile environment, and the Quran guided them in that, in that, uh, in that saga. And, uh, but when you look at Prophet Muhammad, for example, peace be upon him, in his Veda Hutba, that is his farewell uh, sermon, he says, I'm leaving you behind Quran and Sunnah. Actually, one version just says only Quran, and the other version is Quran and Sunnah, or Quran and Ahl Bayt. There are three versions there. But it doesn't say, I'm leaving you a state. He doesn't say, I'm leaving you an empire. I'm leaving you a powerful rulers who will be my uh, representatives. What happened is, after the Prophet, and after the first few caliphs, Islam, Islamic societies did what everybody at the time was doing. There was the Byzantine Empire. There was the Sassanid Empire. So an imperial state was the norm of the time. And Muslims accepted this. Islamic scholars saw a blessing in this, th thought that if the empire imposes the Sharia, that's a good thing. So we should obey the Sultan. And there was no idea that you could have a protest against the Sultan or you know, that you could have NGOs. I mean, the scholars were sometimes limiting the powers, uh, powerful rulers, so that's important. But uh, the thing is, this is to me historical and not religious. Yes, it's in our textbooks, it's in our jurisprudential books, but not because God ordained this, it is because how societies were at the time. And I think making that distinction between what is really religious and what is, what is just historical is, is crucial. Uh, we can make this distinction on many things. For example, we had slavery until 20th century in Islamic law. Uh, now, most scholars will tell you that, well, slavery wasn't something Islam wanted. <laughs> something that Islam aimed to create or preserve, it was just there. And Islam had to or, you know, deal with this. And the ultimate aim was full, actually, emancipation of the slaves. And this was possible in the modern era, thanks to social change. So that's an argument you can uh, hear from some conservative uh, scholars, and that's good. Then I will say, well, just like slavery, there are other things in our religious tradition. The idea that there should be a powerful ruler that you shouldn't criticize, the idea that women should be always obedient to their husbands and never raise their voice and, and have their different opinions and, and men should be dominant. I think these are historical elements in our religious tradition that are not necessarily religious. In other words, we should see them as parts of Muslim history, but not a fundamental truths of Islam as a religion. Since we've gone down that tangent of on a personal level, I've always been uncomfortable with the idea of concubines in Islamic history. And it seems to be accepted, especially during war, that you can conquer women almost as your property. Uh, is that also a misinterpretation? Or that, that, is, that is a clear example. I mean, concubinage is a part of the slavery tradition. Uh, female slaves were called concubines. And 
uh, if they were not married, uh, their owner could use them sexually. And that's not something I find acceptable, right? I mean, most people wouldn't today find it acceptable. And again, but but it was there in the Sharia. It was there in fiqh, in, a, in, a, in the interpretation of Sharia. It was there, it was established. I mean, until the uh, 20th century, I know in Istanbul, there were slave markets that these women were sold. How they were enslaved, when there was a war between Muslims and non-Muslims, the females could be enslaved in that war. And there were even campaigns just to enslave them, right? So this was an ugly part of our history, just like America had an ugly history with slavery, just like Europe had an ugly history of slavery. And uh, it was not a requirement of Islam. It was not a, uh, op a element of Islam. Th that slavery and concubinage was already there when Islam came to the world. And actually Islam improved the status of concubines and slaves, gave them new rights that they didn't have before. Jeez. So I think we should see these as historical baggages that our religious tradition dealt with, improved, but abolishing them and giving equal rights to all human beings is the right thing to do. And we can see that through conscience. We can see that in the fundamental teachings of the Quran. And I think making that distinction it will be really key in any meaningful change in some of our troubling uh, attitudes about religious. A distinction that might be drawn from the U.S., for instance, is nation states progress, laws progress, the constitution progress, but Islam is seen as perfection. That it was, it came down as perfection. So the idea that it can progress or something that was acceptable during the time of the Prophet suddenly is not acceptable because modern values have changed. Um, wouldn't most Muslims be uncomfortable with that idea from an ideological, theological perspective, where? the idea that is entrenched as Islam is perfect and unchangeable. Islam is perfect and unchangeable as religion. And that means the faith, the theology, the, the worship, the ibadat, and the values. Like we will always play, pray five times a day, right? We will not make it seven or two or something. Or Muslims will always fast in Ramadan. We will not say, you know, let's change this. I mean, that's, that's the unchangeable core of Islam. We believe in one God. We believe in Prophet Muhammad, his finality, his everything, and uh, his, his tradition. We respect him. He's not going to change. But muamelat, that is the, that is the uh, legal aspect of Islam that is about social issues. These will change inevitably. Even our scholars realize that. Uh, I mean, one of the uh, fundamental maxims in Majalla, that was the last Ottoman uh, civil code uh, devised in the late 19th century by Ottoman scholars. One of the maxims, one of the rules read, uh, as times change, laws should change. So things like, uh, how do you deal with uh, financial matters? How do you deal with criminal matters? These change over time. Now, the, the scope of that change is, of course, discussed. Some will say, well, there are fundamentals that have never changed, even on these matters. But others will say, even there, we can change. For example, uh, I'll give you a exam clear uh, example, which is, how do we punish theft? Right? If you read the Quran, uh, amputation of hands for men and women, it's very clear. And that's why this has been a fundamental, one of the hudud, like one of the limits the uh, strong uh, foundations of Islamic criminal law. And uh, uh, is it in the Pakistani law? I think it was, uh, it it was is, an Islamization of laws. In, it is in uh, the Hadood ordinance. It is not practiced at all. It's not practiced at all. Well, there's a reason why Muslims actually put it in their ordinances sometimes, but don't practice it, find ways, because it's, it's difficult really to have a society like that when somebody steals a cell phone cut his hand and ruin him for the rest of his life. Whereas if he goes to prison for a few years, maybe he can learn a lesson and he can you know, come back to society and live a normal life. So, uh, but why do we have this nusus? And we of course do not by any means disrespect God by, while asking this, but I'll give you an answer. If you look at the context of the Quran, the, the context of revelation, you see, this was exactly what Arabs were doing. Pre-Islamic Arabs, Jahiliya Arabs, were also amputating hands, which we know from Muslim history. So because the Quran came to a society and the Quran legislated in the norms and conditions of that society. And, and in that society, there was no chance to give a punishment other than that because there were no prisons. 
prisons for establishing a prison, you need a state, a bureaucracy to administer. That didn't exist in say, early seventh century Mecca, which where people lived in small huts and, and there was no even an institution called prison. So the Quran legislated according to the times and norms of the time. And I think the same thing is true for slaves and, and concubines, which you can't find in the Quran. But by improving their rights, by calling for their emancipation. So there's a very strong moral message that comes with that regulation as well. That's why I agree with uh, the great scholar from Pakistan, actually, Fazul Rahman Malik, who was a Pakistani scholar who later lived in the U.S., he says Most we need a double Pakistani movement. Pakistani scholars moved to the U.S. Yes, I mean, because he was not very, he was not left yeah. very safe there, unfortunately. And he 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 says we should go back to the Quran and of course the Sunnah, and and the prophetic tradition. We should see in which context they were revealed, right? And they were exemplified. And if we understand the context, we understand the intention. That's the maqsad. and those intentions are. You, you should prevent crime. You should pr prote protect private property. You should protect life. And for slaves and concubines, the Quran calls for sleep, uh, says freeing a slave is a righteous act. It's actually the first righteous act mentioned in one of the surahs, which says, you know, what are the righteous acts? So that is a that gives you a progressive understanding. Progressive in the sense that you understand that the, the God and His Prophet came and gave a message to us a message that spoke initially to 7th century Arabia and improved the conditions there. But we can today uh, make a distinction between that context and our context. And just like Fazul Rahman said, we can, we can extract the principles and implement the principles today. So that, that means liberating all slaves, of course, and, and giving equal rights to all human beings, which Muslims have been doing, I mean, luckily since the uh, 19th century, but there's resistance to that, as you well know. And the, yeah, the, the challenge continues. A lot of resistance in my country to that. There's yes, also I can the imagine. famous I instance watch. that's told of Hazrat Bilal and Prophet peace be upon him freeing him and then him him giving the call to prayer. Uh, and Malcolm X's quote is quite famous, what he saw when he went to us. So this idea that Islam doesn't discriminate based on colors or people of a certain race aren't uh, ordained to be slaves forever. Uh, so the problem really is, I think sometimes how scholars try and synthesize that amputation of the arm argument is that it's for a perfect society where everybody has food, everybody has a home, and the state provides all of that. Devoid of that, you never have that society. That yeah. So, so it's a way of not giving that punishment. Uh, yeah. But maybe what you're talking about and what your work talks about, a better way to think about it is to move away from literalism. And it has been a huge problem in Islamic jurisprudence, and especially at the level of the mullah who's at the masjid, at the mosque, telling people what Islam says, they tend to be very literal because they may not be as well informed about the history of jurisprudence, about the history of philosophy. So how big a problem is that literalism? And what is your argument for Islamic scholars to move away from that? Well, it's a, of course a big problem. And, and beneath it, there are ideas like uh, theological ideas, you know, actually, which drive people towards literalism. And, and that's why, you know, I, in, in Reopening Muslim Minds, I discussed that. For example, uh, one, one, I think, missing piece here in our common thinking about Islam in the, in the world today, in Pakistan, I'm sure too, is we, we believe that God gave us revelation, the Quran, and, and, and also sent us a prophet, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So these are our guides. That's true. That's what makes us Muslims to believe in them. But how much room do we have to the idea that God also gave every human being an internal conscience, which, which, which we call reason, broadly speaking? So yes, God gave revelation, but God gave us reason too. Now, Islamic scholars, traditional ones will tell you, of course, God gave us reason, akal, without akal, you can't have religion. But by that, they mean the akal, that reason is used to understand the text and to implement it and sometimes comment on it with some limits, right? To, by analogy, you can extend, you know, some of the legal rulings. But besides the text, does reason itself give you values, right? Like, for example, I say slavery was abolished and that was a good thing. Based on what I'm saying that, 
I'm saying that based on reason. In, I'm saying that based on conscience, because we know that if people are enslaved, they have miserable lives, and that's injustice towards them. And we, even if we don't have a religious text telling us that this is injustice, we realize this is injustice, right? Uh, by just feeling their misery, by feeling their persecution, by our feelings of justice that are inherent. But does our theology and does our jurisprudence give epistemological authority to that? Like, can I say, well, I read something in the text, but wait a minute, this does, this sounds unconscientious. This doesn't sound fair. So can we have a, then seek for a reinterpretation? Unfortunately, as a theological turn took place in early Islam, as I argue in my book, Reopening Muslim Minds. And this idea of a conscience, that internal moral compass was categorically denied by the mainstream Sunni approach. Uh, rooted in Ashari theology. Bec and uh, because there was a discussion in early Islam, for example, is God saying murder is wrong because it is inherently wrong and even non-Muslims can realize this? Or God saying murder is wrong and it's wrong because God just says so. So only Sharia gives you the values. And this dispute, which was initially between the Mutazila and the Asharites, was very influential, and the Asharites had the dominant uh, role there. And their view was that Sharia gives you all the values that you need. So there's no ethical value outside of the Sharia. Uh, and that view is still with us. <laughs> Whereas I think I showed the Sunni tradition was more diverse. Actually, the, the Maturidis uh, on this issue came close to the Mutazila, saying that there's an objective ethical value outside of the Sharia. Uh, in the Shia tradition to their alternative voices. Even in some Hanbalis actually moved away from the or original Ashari position. But I think this is the way I think we're thinking about these issues. And when we're thinking like that, of course, you're close to change. You say everything we need to know is in the Sharia. And the Sharia is interpreted as fiqh that's in our textbooks. And we have to implement them. And that's the end of the story. That Then there's nothing to discuss. But I believe... Based on the Quran, God gave us revelation, but also into a moral intuition, taqwa to every human being. And taqwa in the first usage of the Quran means distinguishing between what's right and wrong. And every individual has that. Non-Muslim individuals have that as well. That's why we can also learn from non-Muslims and engage with their ideas and philosophies. And that's how early Muslims engage with Aristotle, right? His, his moral philosophy. They didn't say he's a kafir. But today they will tell you that <laughs> if you go and speak about any non-Muslim thinker uh, in, 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 in any, I think, circles, some, in some certain circles in Pakistan, for sure. And Muslim thinkers are not thanked for introducing Greek philosophy to the West, quote, unquote. Yeah, and, and that was seen as a deviation. Yeah. Like West and East, but quote, unquote, Europe. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And the thing is, this is not to praise the West, but I think what, what I do in my book, actually, Reopening Muslim Minds, is to see that well, thanks to this universalism, the idea that you know different societies, different religions can capture different aspects of reality, of truth, gave us universalism. And that, thanks to that, we Muslims contributed to the West. And people do not know that today, uh, one of the most influential books in the early enlightenment was uh, the novel named Hai Ibn Yaqsan. It was written by Ibn Tufail, the teacher of Ibn Rushd in, in, in Muslim. Spain, Cordoba in the 12th century. And, and his ideas influenced a lot of Western thinkers from John Locke to uh, Spinoza and others. Uh, Islamic, Western financial institutions learned a lot from Muslim banking. You know, we were ahead of the West in, in, in many ways. Uh, Ibn Khaldun preceded some of the ideas about uh, markets and, and uh, economic dynamism, for example, in, in uh, and and it, some people think he had a direct influence on on some European thinkers. So, and that was that was what made Islamic civilization great. I mean, I just want to emphasize one point. I mean, today most Muslims will say, thousand years ago we were the leaders of the world, right? We had the best scientists, we had the best cleanest cities. Uh, our economics were better. Muslims were inventing algorithm and advancing algebra. That's how West learned these things from us. So there's this golden age feeling, which is true. Uh, but what was the secret of golden age? Well, the secret was Muslims didn't say 
all we need to know is in our religious texts. They studied Aristotle, they studied Plato, they studied Galen, they studied Greek philosophy, they studied other philosophy. They learned something from the Indians, the numericals, which became Arabic numerals and then went to the West. So that openness and cosmopolitanism, as I say, that is rooted in the belief that there is a God-given reason and conscience to all humanity. You know, that was, I think, the engine of success in early Islam. And the more we moved away from that and became insular in our thinking that we don't need anything to learn, uh, we, we stagnated. And then, then the West came to us through colonialism. Of course, that was a shock and that was very destructive. And we didn't know exactly what to do, right? And, and, th and that's our crisis that's still going on. Some people said, let's get rid of religion, right? I mean, that's totally oppressed religion. And I'm certainly against that line. That became very influential in Turkey in the Republican era. I'm very critical of that line. But others said, all we need is our religious texts and period, right? Well, that was also the wrong answer. And unfortunately, it's still, uh, is, I think, driving countries to wrong directions. Uh, if I may just give a clarification about what uh, you're arguing about, is that more similar to what Kant says in Metaphysics of Morals, that we collectively can think of reasons based on these principles, as opposed to individual reasons? Because uh, the idea of something seeming unconscientious to me might be different to what seems unconscientious to you. A serial killer yes. might think might not feel unconscientious about murdering 27 people. So at an individual level, if it's uh, as the kids these days call it, reduced to vibes, what vibes I'm getting, uh, it would be hard to argue to base a religious moral code on individual vibes or whims, even if it's seen as reason by that individual. Well, uh... Individual morality cannot legislate, it cannot be the basis of a morality to give into all society, of course. But I do believe in individuals uh, having the sense that they have an internal conscience and sometimes they have a sense of right and wrong because they will meet endless things in life. Like every day you make decisions on many things and you look to your religions as guidance and you look into fatwas, you look into you know, your mevla or your, your scholar, whoever that is. That's okay, but sometimes there might be a position. I mean, with that logic, someone can tell you slavery is fine and you can enslave that person and you can, I mean, I'm, it's a very extreme case, but someone with that logic can tell you if someone is a blasphemer, you should kill him, no problem, and you should be proud of that. And people do that, right? Well, individuals can say, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this. And, you know, I'm basing this to one hadith, which was very not very used in classical Islam. And that is an instance where a sahaba named Wasiba comes to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and asks, uh, uh, asks about him fatwas. And he says, consult your heart, you know, about instead of the, when you get a fatwa, consult your heart. Whatever makes the heart feel tranquil, that's the right way. I'm paraphrasing. So uh, the heart, individual's conscience is important. Now, that doesn't mean that individuals make decisions and just go with them forever and what we need, if individuals have conscience, we need a public uh, order as well. So for the public order, you need conversation between individuals, right? Those different ideas, those the different feelings, those different views should come to public space. That's why you need free, freedom of speech. Uh, Ottoman scholar, uh, intellectual Nama Kemal famously said, uh, which means the truth of the light of truth comes from the clash of ideas. As an individual, you can go somewhere. As an individual, the other person do something. But, but to come to a public understanding, you need discussion. And that discussion is not a discussion that should be only left to the ulema, the scholars, which represent the religious tradition. We respect that. But we need also a realm of individual rationality, philosophy, that also gets engaged with uh, religious uh, tradition which is what Ibn Rushd was speaking about, you know, when he defined philosophy as a legitimate way of seeking truth besides religion. And he was also a great scholar of Islam as well. Uh, so that's how, what I would say about that. And, and when you don't have that individual conscience sense, whatever is justified by religious law can go anywhere and uh, it can lead to dangerous results. I mean, that's how extremism comes. I think blasphemy has been misused in Pakistan a lot and it's also become a buzzword. And I know you've specifically talked what about- What has become a buzz, buzzword? Bla blasphemy. 
and it's misused a lot. Uh, but something which is a lot more enshrined in Islamic law and Islamic history, and I know that you've argued that it's been mistakenly enshrined, but the idea of apostasy, there is less gray area, or at least there's less debate than there is even about blasphemy. Apost I think at most, what a religious scholar would argue is don't kill somebody who's committed apostasy, just send them outside of the city or outside of the country. Now, even the idea that if somebody leaves Islam, you should just kick, kick that person out of the city. It may stand in stark contrast to the public morality or the public consciousness. But if that is an enshrined principle, which should win? Uh, well, uh, I think I'm against both having blasphemy laws and apostasy laws, I should say that clearly. And I think they're, none of them are grounded in the Quran in the first place. And I think their illegit bases in the Sunnah are open to interpretation, that, as I discuss in the book. And we, we, we don't have to uh, take them as bases, actually. And, and, and uh, I argue for that in detail by going through the stories and the uh, life of the Prophet Muhammad and, and so on and so forth. First of all, in the Quran, I mean, you know, probably every Muslim knows this. There is a very important verse, la ikraha right? No compulsion in religion. No compulsion in religion. Uh, but when I recited la ikraha fiddin in a conference in Malaysia and said, this means there should be no compulsion in religion, including apostasy laws, uh, I was arrested for that by the Malaysian <laughs> religion. The police. full quote is, there is no compulsion, but we may detain you. <laughs> there is no religion compulsion, but there is religion police, which does compulsion. But there is airport police. <laughs> and, and the interesting thing is, in Malaysia, in the official translation of the Quran, when it is la ikra uh, no compulsion in religion, they actually add a few words into the translation. They write, there is no compulsion in religion while entering Islam. So the idea is that, well, we're not going to coerce you they, to they enter. They heard Hotel apostasy. California a few times. Yeah, you once can, you enter, you then can, there is coercion. You can check then out any coercion. Time, but you can never yeah. leave. <laughs> yeah, people make that joke. And uh, you can't leave, it's there. And the thing is, listen, we are Muslims and we don't want people to apostatize. We don't want people to lose their faith, right? That's not, I'm, I'm arguing here. But if somebody really loses his faith and doesn't believe in Islam anymore, First of all, you cannot make that person forcefully a Muslim again. You can make him a hypocrite, a munafiq, which is worse than disbelief. So there is no meaning to that. Uh, second, the whole, it's not in the Quran. That's why they're inserting words into the Quran to make, make it justified. Uh, it comes from a, 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 a illegit hadith, I can say, in Sahih al-Buhari, whereas you hear the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says, Whoever uh, leaves his religion, kill him. Very strong, right? That's the basis. There's another hadith which is also uh, coming to the same conclusion. The thing is, we hear these hadiths. These are hadiths with ahad hadiths that are, they had just one narrator. It's not that they come from different chains, which are called mutawatir. So these are actually sahih, but doubtable hadiths compared to mutawatir ones. Second, we don't have any instance in the prophet's life where people apostatize and he gets kill, uh, people for gets people killed for that. We actually have instances that he doesn't do anything against the apostates. There is a verse in the Quran which says, "Those they believe Islam, they believe during the uh, beginning of the day and they deny at the end of the day to confuse Muslims." It doesn't say go and kill them for apostasy. So there's a whole literature on this that the whole idea of apostasy ban is a later invention in Islam. And you know what? It's interesting. When you look into the context of early Islam, when you look at the Byzantine Empire, oh, they had apostasy laws as well. When you look at the Sasanid Empire, they had apostasy laws as well. It was just the norm of the time because it was also at a time when the apostate would potentially join the enemy. So you would see them as political treason as well. Now, these things are gone. I mean, that context in the world is gone. When people lose their faith in Islam and openly say that, they are not committing terrorist acts the next day, right? It's not a political crime. So I think people should let this go. And the idea that you should expel them, of course, it's better than killing them, but, you know, <laughs> that's kind of a moderation in, in, in a limited sense. But I think that, that even doesn't hold. The question is, why are we afraid? Like, why are we afraid to hear that somebody who doesn't believe in Islam? Can't we answer that person? Don't we have a, I mean, when he uh, pronounces his ideas, uh, will we be ruined? Like, are we that intellectually weak? Is that the reason? And secondly, we should understand that we live in a world where 
equality before the law is the norm. And in other words, we should not do unto others things that should not be do done to us. Imagine if Christians punish their apostates, which are sometimes Muslims. If they did, if they threatened them, if they jailed them, as they, it happens in Saudi Arabia, if sent to rehabilitation centers, as in Malaysia, or in Pakistan, you said at least banishment, right? Okay, that's better. But imagine, like, I mean, there are there are prominent Islamic scholars who are living in America, in UK. We respect them. We read their books, right? Sheikh Hamza, you know, Abdul Hakim Murad. I have great respect for them. They are apostates from Christianity, right? Did wouldn't be offended if they were exiled and they were punished and they were threatened. Uh, no, they can freely change their faith and speak out in the name of their new faith. And, and that's, that's freedom and, and that's something respectable. And I think we need the same thing. If people, uh, and one more thing, what really makes people apostates from Islam are precisely these oppressive measures, most of the time, not always, but I looked into why the, the movements of you know, leaving Islam, people becoming uh, ex-Muslims, these sectors, they have different reasons. Some people just go for philosophical reasons. But most of the time you also see oppression in the name of Islam, violence in the name of Islam, bigotry, oppression of women, and uh, including these religious freedom issues as the reason. Therefore, by, by trying to force people to stay in Islam by, or by try, trying to force people to respect Islam by blasphemy laws, I don't think we're bringing any real respect to our faith, to our beloved prophet, and our tradition. It's what you write about using Locke's idea of the contempt of the divine majesty. If you're going to thrust it down. Okay, great. Yeah. You read that. Okay, good. Yes. People will obviously reject it. I may be fuzzy on the details, but there's an instance of repeated in Pakistan about tribes that only pretended to convert to Islam because they got a tax rebate. So they're called the Munafiks. And then what? I didn't sorry, I understand them. Uh, there I is didn't... a. There is an yeah. instance, and uh, I may be fuzzy on the details because I'm remembering this from my Islamic studies class a couple of decades ago, but there was a tribe that converted to Islam only to get the tax rebate or to not have to pay jazia that non-Muslims. Okay. And after the time of Prophet, they just went back. So they're called Munafiks and then war is waged on them. So would the yeah. argument be that it's a political war and the war is not being waged because they've left Islam? Yeah, I mean, these are the first actually Ridda Wars, uh, that is right after Prophet's passing during the time of Caleb, Caleb uh, Abu Bakir, uh, radiallahu anh. And what happens is uh, there were tribes in Medina who had accepted, there were tribes in the Arabian Peninsula who had given pledge to Medina, to the Muslim state in Medina. Uh, yeah, they were not paying Jews yet, so they had become Muslim. So when Prophet passed away, they said, we're not loyal to the Medina state anymore. We are on our own. Some were leaving Islam itself. So they were real apostates. Others were just not giving the tax. They said, we are Muslim, but we're not going to pay tax. And Caliph Abu Bakr launched war against them, which was, I should say, a controversial decision. We know that Umar, uh, which become the next Caliph, actually disputed uh, the Caliph on this issue. But he went with his own decision, which to me shows that it was politics of the seventh century. I mean, if you're trying to establish a state, you don't want people to break away from you. So for the sake of the state, you know, he fought, uh, but it is not an Islamic blueprint that we have to keep following. Just like slavery, it was a norm of the time and it's not a uh, guide, guides, it's not an eternal principle that should guide Islam and Muslims. Another instance that's quoted a lot by religious scholars is even during time, the time of Fatai Makkah, the conquer, uh, when they conquered Makkah and there was a general amnesty, everybody was forgiven, but a blasphemer was killed. Is there any veracity to that claim? Uh, we will, yes, uh, I discussed that in the book, actually, uh, we, which brings us to the discussion on blasphemy, which uh, I know is sensitive in Pakistan. And it was, uh, it was nice knowing all of you. Take it. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to put Remember anybody in me. here. Uh, no, but I, mean, a, I mean, if we are an Islamic country, why should we be afraid of talking about Islam? We're talking actually about yes. Islam. Yes, here's one thing. I'll, show, I'll tell you one thing. As Muslims, we don't want people to offend our religion. And we, do, we don't want to hear it and see that. That's normal, right? But what do we do when someone says something offensive is a different discussion, right? Uh, and even what happens when we have blasphemy laws where people get into jail or get killed, even if they haven't actually blasphemed, but there was just a false accusation, which is very unfortunately, I think. 
routine case uh, very, happening often in, in Pakistan. Now, I'll tell you, I don't believe there should be any blasphemy laws in Islam or Muslim nation states like Pakistan. First of all, there is absolutely no basis for that in the Quran. Uh, actually, Quran tells what to do in the face of blasphemy, and it has nothing to do with violence or even jailing or censorship. It is actually, let me read that verse so people uh, can see what I mean. Even the it's, Hanafi school of thought that we follow says blas the blasphemy law is non applicable to non Muslims, which yes, they, is primarily who we apply it to. Exactly. At least they didn't give the death penalty. You know, they thought there could be some tazir, but uh, they were actually milder than today's Pakistani law. So that's interesting. And Pakistan is traditionally Hanafi, but that, there's a complication there. Now, the Quran says, in Nisa 140, if you hear people denying and ridiculing God's revelation, like th think in Medina, this is a Medina and worse. People are sitting there and denying the Quran and ridiculing about it, laughing about it. These are the polytheists or maybe the Jewish, some of the Jewish tribes there. It says, do not sit with them unless they start to talk of other things or else you yourselves will be like them. Now, what does God say? Do not sit with them. It doesn't say go and kill those people. It doesn't go and make sure you silence them. It says just do not sit with them, disengage with them. In other words, in uh, Al Imran uh, 186, uh, the Quran says, you are sure to hear much that is hurtful from those who were given the scripture before you. So we will hear some hurtful words, offensive words or from the mushrikeen, from the polytheists. So what we should do, the word says, if you're steadfast and mindful of God, that is the best course. We can hear hurtful words, but we should stay solid on our faith. And commenting on this, uh, Fahreddin al-Razi, the great Sunni uh, exegete uh, of the Quran, he says this verse isn't abrogated. He also supports it with other words, including the servants of the Lord of mercy, that's God, those walk humbly on earth, and when the foolish address them, they say peace. When the foolish say something foolish, you know, you say salam and move on. Uh, this is the spirit of the Quran, and there's really nothing, no base for blasphemy laws in the Quran. That's why the blasphemy laws came late in Islamic jurisprudence. The basis, the alleged base, is uh, some reports in the life of Prophet Muhammad. And there we have certain poets who had written satirical uh, lines about the prophet or Islam, and they were killed by Muslims in different occasions. Uh, uh, one in Medina and one and after one of the battles and several individuals after uh, the conquest of Mecca, where mo most people were given amnesty, but these were single. Now, I went through all those stories uh, in my book, in Reopening Muslim Minds. And I show that those people were not just poets. Yes. They wrote satirical poets, but they physically attacked Muslims as well. Or their poets were not just lines, their poets were used to start a war against Muslims. For example, one of them is Qabit al Ashraf, a prominent figure in Medina. He was a poet critical of Prophet Muhammad, but what he did with his poetry, when he went to Mecca, he convinced the Meccans to launch the battle of Uhud against Muslims. And he physically attacked uh, Muslims too, as, as we know from one of the narrations. So it was not just he was saying nasty things. He was also a physical aggressor and an initiator of war. So that's something different. That's called what we call incitement to violence in the modern language. Whereas there are other cases where some people say nasty things to Prophet and Muslims get angry, you know, Umar gets out and I'll punish him. Prophet says, no, don't do that. You know, just calm down. So there are cases where Prophet actually didn't punish people when they said things that are hurtful. It was just words. Uh, so I think the blasphemy law the, uh, is wrongly tied to these stories of certain individuals executed. They were executed not just hurtful words, but for other crimes as well. And that's the view of some early Hanafis, by the way. So today, I think there is no really religious basis to go and kill people for their offensive words. Oh, second, I think we're not bringing any respect to Islam or Muslims by doing these things. I mean, I, sadly, like I, I live in now in the U.S. Once in a while, I see in the, in the U.S. newspapers, some other innocent person gets killed in Pakistan, lynched by mobs, burned, uh, and people taking phones. And when people see that, do you think, oh, 
we respect Prophet Muhammad and his beautiful people. Like, do they feel like that? No, quite the contrary. That that shows people in the world that makes them think that this is a violent religion and, and these people cannot really behave normally. And, and that's not the image that our religion deserves. And give a, let, forget the image. It's not what it's not the value that we should really share to the world. Some person says something, it is not even not even an offense. Uh, unintentionally maybe says something that that does something and gets killed for it i think that that's not service to islam that is this service to islam uh, let alone a great injustice to those individual uh, individuals innocent people who were killed or jailed for this over the years something that you said uh, a while back was this, this idea that what is of God that should stay in one sphere and what's political, what's personal should stay in another sphere. But the idea that is presented in Islam is fundamentally different from other religions because it's not just a personal religion. It's also a political system and that is inherent to what Islam is. And uh, secularism is seen as a dirty word. Something that you've also spoken about is that the idea of the French secularism is what was presented as secularism, which is why the Muslim or Islamic hate for secularism may come from that. But can we, or should we imagine a secular idea where the church and state are separated because it is primarily the state that has misused Islam or tried to say that the Quran says this just to justify their power? Uh, I would disagree with the idea that Islam as a religion is by definition, by its core, is tied to the state. In Muslim history, yes, it has been the case. But as I said, I make a distinction between Muslim history and the unchanging principles of Islam. The Quran doesn't speak of any state, doesn't define a state, tells Muslims to obey the prophet. But we don't have a prophet today, so obeying the prophet could be just following his teachings. That's not a state. Uh, and then after the prophet Muhammad, Muslims just uh, had a history of their own. They established states, they established empires from the Umayyads to Abbasids, the Ottomans, just like Christians did. You know, there were so many Christian empires in history. Does this make today Christians that they should have an empire, they should have a state? No. And let's also not forget that the why actually Christians had to move to this idea of separation of church and state. Um, I mean, you can see this in the writings of John Locke, who was one of the earliest advocates of this idea. Uh, and he did this because Christians were killing each other for politics, for states, for domination, for a long time. This was the 17th century when Catholics and Protestants were engaged in bloody battles, like a 30 years war. There were massacres. Uh, people were being killed, tortured, burned at the stake alive for being a heretic. And thinkers like Locke said, the solution to this violence, which is destroying Christianity and ruining uh, so many innocent lives, is to make sure the state doesn't interfere in these theological discussions. The state is neutral. The state allows religious communities to do what they do, but not takes them as one of them as its own doctrine. And the state only protects the rights of individuals, right? Human rights. It was, it was, it was natural rights, it was called, and it would be called human rights later. And thanks to this idea, actually, Muslims are doing pretty well in the West, right? I mean, uh, in, in America, where I live, there are all kinds of Muslims, Hanafi, Shafi, you know, Wahhabi, Salafi, Shia, Ahmadis, everybody, every kind of group uh, that you can associate somehow with the Muslim tradition. And uh, none of them are persecuting each other. They're all, ha they're happily living and practicing their religion because the state isn't Christian, the state isn't Hanafi, the state isn't something, the state is neutral, the state just respects you as a human being. And the Christians came to this after terrible experiences of violence and oppression in the name of religion. And I think that's a good solution. And we Muslims should consider that. Uh, and uh, the idea that Islam defines a state, it is history, I think. Islam doesn't define a state. Islam defines individuals. Islam defines believers and communities. The Quran doesn't speak to a state. The Quran speak to Mu'minun, the, the, the believers of Islam or other religious communities. And religious models can change. It's a, it's a rational realm that God has left to humanity. It was a you know, little city state in the beginning. It became empires, it became republics. Uh, anything can happen. And I do believe that the more Muslims lead to political secularism, like 
By secularism, I don't mean that we should try to minimize the role of religion in society. Uh, and, and secularism has also been understood as an anti-religious idea, unfortunately, in, in our Islamic history in, in the 20th century. Like in Turkey, secularism meant you close down the madrasas. That was wrong, right? Secularism means protection of the state from religion, but also protection of the religion from the state. So that sort of liberal secularism, which I see in the US is I think a good model and it will allow Muslims to coexist peacefully. Just like, I mean, imagine Pakistan, who's, who's Islam, you know, is it the Deobandi, the Barelvi and Al Hadith? And uh, I mean, I'm not gonna mention Ahmadis because people don't consider them uh, Ahmadis, but you know, they define themselves as Muslims and I respect them as they define themselves. And uh, I think a state that just represents, sees everybody as just citizens, with equal rights, as Qaeda uh, Azam Jinnah, I think, imagine in the beginning. I think that was the right model. That's the right model for Pakistan, right model for all Muslim societies. It's kind of ironic that our country was made for minorities to freely practice their faith, which even the majority cannot freely practice their faith yeah. anymore. You, you know, we see the blessing of secularism, again, liberal secularism, let's say even liberalism, uh, when we look to situations where Muslims are minorities, just leave Pakistan past the border, check India. Uh, in, in India, do we want a religious state? And which religion will that be? It's not going to be Islam. It's going to be Hindu uh, religion, but as defined by Hindutva, the militant Hindu nationalist movement, which is threatening India's Muslims, attacking India's Muslims, unfortunately. And in India, Muslims are defending the liberal constitution. Uh, against the Hindu Twa. So uh, I think they're doing the right thing. And I think both in India and in, in, in Pakistan, what we need is liberal constitutions and legal systems that protects all citizens, regardless of their uh, creed. It's, it's that same uh, hypocrisy. Uh, I'm against Macron. I think the ban on the hijab is stupid in France. But the same people who argue that the ban is stupid argue that a burqa should be mandated in Pakistan. So they're arguing for completely different things. Whereas yeah. in France, the, because it's a non-Muslim country, they can't yeah. impose their values. But because Pakistan is a Muslim country, we can impose our values. Well, uh, France unfortunately gives all the ammunition to <laughs> all these uh, Islamist groups who want to impose their way of life because France seems to does it on the other side. right? And that's why I'm, I'm always critical of France in its not liberal secularism. I mean, France is an exceptional case. France is not a good example when it comes to religious freedom. And it's so unfortunate that France has been the main inspiration of secularity or secularism in the Muslim world. Turkey got its idea from France. It's called, we call laïc, which is laïcite, French. Tunisia, uh, the same way. Uh, and of course, whenever I criticize uh, let's say the Taliban bringing a, a hijab ordinance or uh, standard for Muslim women, the, the defenders of Taliban say, what about France? Why are you not saying anything against that? Well, I respond, well, I am saying against something France all the time, but actually you cannot say anything against that because you are interfering in women's lives and telling them what to wear. And let's also, let's criticize France, but in France, it's not that you cannot wear it on the street, right? I mean, they have the, on, on public schools and, and public offices. The Taliban mandates it, right, how are you gonna walk on the street? So that is even beyond that. Um, so uh, my, my principle is to defend individual freedom everywhere. Sometimes it's good for Muslims who want to wear a niqab, I'll fight for the right to wear a niqab, you know, in Europe. Uh, whereas I will wear the right to not to wear hijab or niqab or any, any traditional dress in, in, in Muslim society. And when you leave that to, to women who have the right to choose what they will do, they do what they do. I mean, they, they, are, they will look at society, they, everybody, everybody lives in a society and they will observe its norms to some extent and society find its way. One wrong idea, I think, in our Muslim communities is that when we don't ban something with harsh laws, everybody will do it, right? Like, uh, if you don't ban alcohol next day, everybody will become alcoholic and doing like these drug parties every day or something like that. No, I mean, most people don't do these things because it's not their religious tradition. I mean, most women will still wear the hijab because they think it's their religious duty and they have the right to do so. My country, Turkey, is not uh, imposing hijab or banning alcohol for a century now under the secular republic. 
still an overwhelming majority of Turks are pretty conservative people. That's why uh, half of Pakistan because the state is told in, them to do so. Sorry, that's, what, that's why half of Pakistan is in Turkey every summer. <laughs> yeah, and no, no, I mean that's fine. Some part of the Turkish society is secular in this lifestyle, but that's still a small segment compared to the more conservative the Turkish society. Those those conservative Turks remain conservative, pious in their own understanding, not because the state was dictating to them, but they they believe in it and they sustain it through civil society. Turkey is interestingly becoming secular more now uh, in terms of people leaving Islam. You know, there's a big movement towards deism in Turkey among young generations. Uh, not because the old secularists, but because people are disillusioned with Erdogan and his Islamists in power and, and their corrupt and uh, corrupt ways which use religion as a justification make a lot of people really feel quite... Uh, disenchanted with religion and contempt of his divine president. Uh, what uh, his is it historically incidental? So when Christians were killing Christians, secularism was born. Whereas Muslims have been killing Muslims, and what you call the Khawarji is the first fitna, which led to the divide. Why did we not go down the secularism route? Whereas when Muslims were killing Muslims, it almost seems like this insecurity of the state to hold on to. Uh, or almost gatekeep Islam became even stronger. Well, when the Khawarij appeared and they were killing Muslims, we didn't invent secularism as such, but we invented, we Muslims developed a theology which was not secular, but which was actually pluralist and tolerant. And that's the Murjia uh, teaching that I discuss actually in the book. Are you familiar with that, Irja theology? I I thought the main fight was between who is the true Muslim, which... Yeah, yeah. The, the fight was who's a true Muslim, and there were supporters of Muawiyah and uh, Ali, yeah. radiallahu an, and uh, I, I would side with Ali in that you know historic battle, but uh, whatever. Ultimately, the Khawarij came, and uh, these were the fanatics, right? They were killing both sides, everybody. They thought everybody who's not like them is... And there was this big discussion on whether the great sins make you a kafir or not, and uh, the, the, the Khabarij, the dissenters, represent the extreme fringe takfiris, right? They, they condemn other fellow Muslims and attack them as well. Uh, the antidote, the other end, the, 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 uh, the remedy to this zealotry was a theology called Irja theology. Uh, it was defended by Hanafis uh, and, and gradually became more popular in the uh, Sunni world. Uh, it was the idea that irja means postponement. The defenders of this idea said, we don't know who is the right Muslim. God knows this. Let's postpone this decision to afterlife to be resolved by God. So on this world, we're not going to judge other Muslims as kafir, right? Even if they sin, they commit a sin, it's their sin, but we're not going to excommunicate for the, them. And for that's itself. all what Muslims did for the next few centuries. I mean, it was not a secular state, but it was a it was a secularizing theology in the sense that it left decisions to God and just told you to do your own uh, religiosity and don't fellow, judge the fellow Muslim. Uh, I mean, similar approaches took place in Christianity too, but ultimately Christianity was in a big crisis in the 17th century uh, after the Protestant Reformation, bloody, bloody persecutions, and also kings claiming divine rights, powerful kings, you know, saying I'm here because God chose me, sort of. Uh, and against that, liberalism was born, saying let's leave religion to individuals and communities, let states be neutral, also, let states protect the rights of individuals, not any religious belief. And the rulers should be responsible to the people. They should not be, you know, uh, all, all powerful. The rulers should be constrained by natural rights and natural law. These are universal values. That gave uh, the success to Europe that it has. And, uh, of course, there were terrible episodes in this modernization period, too, like Nazis and fascism. And these were reactions to this liberal path. Uh, but today, I think there's a reason why so many Muslims, when they are traumatized in their countries, they want to migrate to where? I mean, they don't want to migrate to North Korea. They won't want to live in. They want to live in these Western liberal democracies, as as troubled as they are, as 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 you know, there are bigotries, there are racism, there's still all kinds of problems. But 
I think the way forward, we are in, the, I believe, in the 17th century of Christianity. We are going through that crisis. We see how religious fanaticism harms religion itself uh, and, and makes people oppress each other in the name of God. And, and it's harming faith itself. It's harming humanity. And, and I think we should, uh, we should go to the same path. One thing is that secularism was brought to the Muslim world by authoritarian leaders like Ataturk, the founder of my country. And the, the people thought that, well, this is just something coming from outside, especially the colonial, so we have to reject it. But now by living through the experience of religious violence and bigotry, we're seeing the value in that. Okay, so there's a value in keeping the state neutral because otherwise these religious groups keep fighting for the state and they use the state to uh, advance their uh, and impose their subjective beliefs. When you talk about this reinterpretation, it's almost at times seen as a revisionist history of Islam and that's, that idea may not be as palatable. Uh, you've even spoken about Ibn Khadib saying that when um, Hadith is in contrast to factual reality, the Hadith needs to be reinterpreted in light of the factual reality. That's not an idea which to the traditional Muslim or the Islamic scholar is a very palatable idea. So we can make that idea palatable in terms of reality, in terms of factual reality, but how do we make that argument that reinterpreting Hadith in the light of facts is actually an Islamic position? Well, what I'm saying about the Hadith is that, I mean, in terms of reevaluating the Hadith, in terms of facts, like historical knowledge could be a way to measure the authenticity of Hadith. But I'm also emphasizing evaluating the Hadith by looking at its content and comparing that with the Quran, right? I think that the Quran is the guiding source here, and the Hadith should be always compared to the Quran. And, and if a teaching of the Hadith will clearly contradicts a, a basis in the Quran, then we should be skeptical about that hadith. For example, I mean, I, I read in Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, whomever leaves his religion, kill him. Then I go see the Quran and la ikra din or who, uh, the truth is from your Lord, let anyone who want to believe it, believe it. Let anyone who want to disbelieve it, disbelieve it. So verses like that, uh, these go against each other, right? And that's why the... <laughs> The Malaysians and the Saudi translations sometimes do the same. They insert these parentheses into the Quran saying that there's no compulsion only while entering because you have to keep the Sahih Bukhari, kill those who live their religion thing also as authoritative. Uh, so I subscribe to this uh, not Quran only view. We need the Hadith. We need the Sirah to get a sense of uh, the context of the Quran to learn about the life of the Prophet Muhammad. And there's a lot of wisdom there. And I'm sure Many hadiths are authentic and, and that's important, but we need to revive the criteria. And there are books about that actually. One is written by a scholar from your country, uh, reviving the hadith, I mean, revisiting the criteria. I can share the uh, title with them. A, a Pakistani scholar wrote a very good book about this several years ago. And there is a whole literature about this. And uh, one we should not forget is that this idea that the hadith should be judged according to the Quran was there in the very beginning. It's, it was the approach of the jurists called Ahl al -Rey. There was Ahl al-Hadith, the, the proponents of Hadith that was based in Medina. And in Iraq, there was another theological jurisprudential school called Ahl al -Rey. They took the Quran as the guiding light and they believed in human reason, istihsan, to make legal judgments. And they respected Hadith, but they were not that sure about the authenticity of these narrations that were going around. And they emphasize the metan, that's the content, the, 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 the text of the hadith and checking that. The Ahlal Hadith view, which became dominant in Sunni Islam, said, we just check the narrations, uh, the narrators, the Ravi, uh, the, the people who said this one from one to another, the chain of transmitters. If we establish the chain of transmitters, then it's done. You know, if it's Sahih, it's Sahih, it's, it's, it's the end of story. Uh, and uh, even then, of course, they made distinction between this and that, uh, the weak ones and the Sahih ones and the Mutawatir ones. But let's not forget, when Sahih Buhari was written, there were 700,000 narrations. And he chose a few thousand of them as the authentic ones. So look at the pool of 
not fully trustable hadiths among what he chose. And always our today hadith uh, ad, uh, strong hadith advocates will say, oh, they they were so careful about how they judge those people. They look at their morality, all the rabbis and everything. I understand that. I respect that. But this is human compilation written two centuries after the Prophet Muhammad. There could be mistakes. And they probably never considered that a rabbi, a transmitter, can be honest, but still can be fooled by his own memory. People imagine things, I mean, wishfully. Sometimes when people in a certain position, they tend to imagine that the prophet said that way. So there is a whole literature on this, I mean, on, on reviving, uh, revisiting the Hadith collections with the Quran as the unbreakable, uh, you know, the, the Quran is a solid foundation for Islamic teachings. And I, I subscribe to that. And, and, and this is not new in Islam. I just want to say that. This is not just a modern. I mean, it is new in the sense of the people. I mean, people didn't hear this maybe back in the 19th century. But in the very beginning of Islamic tradition, in this division of Ahl al-Hadith and Ahl al-Ray, we see actually this was a major issue. So the debate in Islamic jurisprudence and history is constantly like, what is the fundamental truth? What does the Quran say? Would you go as far to say that something like the vagueness in the Quran is a beauty. For instance, the U.S. Supreme Court has argued for this repeatedly that the idea of we the people in the Constitution, the text has not changed. It still says we the people, but it said we the people when the same people owned slaves. What we meant and what people meant has progress as society has progressed. So that vagueness in what we the people means is actually a quality of the Constitution rather than something that restricts it. Would you go as far to argue that if there's vagueness in the Quran, if there are words with multiple interpretations, it's actually better as opposed to us fighting and arguing over and finding the right interpretation. Would it be better if we let go of that idea that there is one right interpretation for us to find? Well, uh, there is no one right interpretation to impose on everybody, but as individuals and communities, we can say this is the right interpretation we find most persuasive and we follow that and you know we can advocate that one. But your analysis, I mean, your analogy is correct. I mean, we the people, I mean, the US Constitution was written like 18, sorry, 1776, you know, those years. And uh, it's been a long time and it's been interpreted. Of course, in the, in the US, when they interpreted, they also brought amendments, right? The new additions oh. to those. So these were ijma, you know, and, and added, being added to the <laughs> tradition there, if you will. But the US Constitution was written as a constitution. It was meant to be a constitution. And uh, the thing in our... Uh, religious text is that there might there there could be things that are not even meant to be religious. I mean, look at all the, for example, example of prophetic medicine uh, to be ne Nebavi. I mean, people will say Prophet Muhammad did this as a way to cure illness and they would still do certain things. Well, one way of looking at that is that people ask Prophet Muhammad about how to heal something and he gave the information that his society had. I mean, Prophet Muhammad did it is not a supernatural being he's a human being he received revelation from god that's why the revelation guided him but besides that he had his own culture he had his own knowledge of his day so he said things that are maybe just the knowledge of his day which changes according to time by the way i mean when he came from mecca and medina he saw new practices and he said you know uh, you know the world better than me i mean actually your worldly affairs in in some instance so, or for example, when Prophet Muhammad was, uh, besides the battle, like on where to camp the army, one of his uh, sahaba asked him when he made a decision, is this your decision or is it a revelation? And he said, when it's my decision, you know, he suggested something else. So there's a humanity of Prophet Muhammad as a person who lived uh, in seventh century Arabia with the culture of the time. We should be even able to be distinguishing that. So therefore I believe in first, seeing the hadiths and the Quran in their historical context, seeing what is that some of the things are just the things they were, they're not meant to be religious, you know, in terms of like prophetic medicine, for example. Uh, second, uh, I do believe that the hadith collection, because inventing hadiths was the best way to advance a doctrine, I mean, in, in, in early Islam. Uh, you could invent hadith about the blessings of your own tribe, and uh, and you could, and people know this. I mean, there were so many mevdu made hadiths. The, the 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 thing is, our tradition claims we have figured out all the mevdu hadiths and pushed them aside, and these are the right ones. Well, how do we exactly hundred percent know the right ones? And uh, this is a very complicated matter. But 
I do believe in upholding the Quran and being skeptical of the hadiths that are uh, in tension with the Quran. And especially when they bring in things like apostasy laws, blasphemy laws, quite uh, uh, denigrating views about women, uh, which are in the hadiths. Uh, there's a whole literature on this, and I believe in we need some uh, revisiting, uh, re redefining the criteria on hadiths. It's, I think it's the same argument of inten intentionality, right? So, for instance, the, if pro the Prophet peace be upon him did misfaq, it's not necessary for you to look for miswak as the idea is take care of your oral hygiene. Cleanliness, so yes. Doing that with toothpaste and yeah. toothbrush, you're still following the sunnah. You don't necessarily need that miswak all over again. Uh, yeah. This idea that, again, you've spoken about it at length, that go for it. You want to say something? Yeah, I mean, I would say the thing is, of course, if people want to use miswak, let them use it. You know, I'm not, but but I agree with you on that. What we should extract from such examples is the the spirit of it. I mean, like it's probably if he had toothbrush and toothpaste, probably he would be using that in seventh century uh, Arabia. The other thing, I mean, Prophet Muhammad had a certain dress code. I mean, he was wearing a turban and you know tunic and all that. Well, I mean, of course, that has become the sunnah. Whereas I would say, well, Abu Jahl was wearing similar clothes. I mean, the, it was the fashion of 7th century society Arabia. I mean, maybe it is not what necessarily we have to do it. Or, or there might not be any particular religious value in wearing those clothes. Uh, and again, people can wear it. I respect it. I mean, they, they might think the right way. But another way of looking at it, this is to say the, the culture of the prophet and the lifestyle, the ways of it. people, some people, I know people who would prefer to eat with hands instead of uh, spoons or forks because that's a sunnah. Whereas I would say if prophet probably had forks and spoons, uh, which was rare, I mean, it's not that easy to make in the desert and you don't have much wood, probably he would use those things. And, and that's way of one way of looking into this. These Again, it's very political, formal interpretations of Sunnah. It's political what people extract. I mean, in the same land where Hazrat Aisha rode a camel to war, women couldn't drive till a couple of years ago. And the camel was the car of that time. So if yeah. the most respected woman in Islamic history, somebody that we call our mother of the entire Ummah, or another example, you touched upon women. There is a uh, there are a few hadiths advising against women traveling alone uh, by a distance of one day or three days. Depend there are a few versions of that narration. Uh, I would think that the prophet advised against women traveling alone because it was quite dangerous in the Arabian desert to for a woman to go alone where you had bandits and no safe roads and vehicles. Uh, today, the, therefore, I would say if a woman is traveling in a safe environment, driving a car and a bus, I think that should be okay. Uh, but there are scholars who will tell you this is a hadith, and you know we don't allow women to go to. to and Taliban is not bringing that law as, as, as law of the land in Afghanistan. So, is it a fundamental rethink? Because again, we're taught that uh, the Quran and Islam was was revealed forever. So, if we say or you argue that no, it was, it was revealed and delivered in a specific context for a specific society and everything needs to be understood with that context. Is it in line with historical Islamic thought or is it a little rejig of how we look at religion? It is in line with, uh, the thing is, we have one tradition, mainstream Sunni tradition that came to us theologically Ashari or sometimes Salafi, uh, let's say Al-Hadith. Maturidism was there, but never much cultivated. And then we have the four method, right? I mean, we, we know this as Islamic tradition, but if you go to the a few centuries before the formation of these schools, you will see that all these issues were discussed. Like the, how contextual these, are these words? What's the role of reason? Can reason besides revelation find ethical value? These were all discussed. And that's why I go through these discussions in my book to, to reopen by reopening Muslim minds. I mean, re remembering some of the things in our tradition that we actually forgot or didn't cultivate. Um, I mean, Ibn Rush says, you know, there are unwritten laws of humanity. He refers to human conscience and he says, if they clash with the written text, we should look at the written text. That is the, you know, Islamic, Islamic jurisprudence. So those ideas are there. And, and I think we need those. What has happened is Islamic law had a context. Yes. And I believe 
The Quran gave us eternal, unchanging principles of Islam. Also, it legislated some contextual affairs. And this is so clear. I mean, when you read the Quran, uh, you will read verses about forbidden months. Haram, uh, Aylar, that we say, forbidden months. What is forbidden months? Well, it was a custom that pre-Arab, pre-Islamic Arabs had. They were not fighting in these four months, but other, uh, other months in the Arabic Peninsula, they could be fighting with the tribes. Now, if you leave Arabia, nobody knows that. And that's why Islamic jurisprudence even de didn't develop that. It was an Arab custom that Quran uh, organized because it, had, it was speaking to real people there who was living in a culture. So should we establish a tradition of forbidden months all across the world today because it's in the Quran? Uh, no, because what we understand from that is that if there are some customs in society, if they're not bad, respect them. If they're bad parts of it, you can adjust them. It could be something else in another society. Uh, I think the Quran is, we should be able to distinguish between the, the legislation that is contextual, and we should be able to distinguish between the teachings that are universal. And is this a totally new idea in Islam? It's not totally new because there are theological precedents for this, but it is partly new because why? Because it is only us Muslims who live in a radically different context, modern day Muslims. Now you said, told me that women were driving camels and now of course it, it could be cars today. Only you can say this, no scholar would say this until two centuries ago because everybody was still driving camels two, two centuries ago. Like, we are living in a context, like you, you give the miswak example and the toothbrush. Nobody would give this example a century ago because there were no toothbrushes and toothpastes or whatever. So because we live in a growingly different and even becoming more different faster and faster, radically different context, we see that there's something that doesn't fit, right? So it's, it is on our, I think it's our duty to see this gap, to make a sense of this without abandoning our loyalty to the core of Islam, while also making Islam livable and reasonable and conscientious in, in the modern age. Uh, and, and I know it's not an easy task, but, and I don't I think that every single individual Muslim can do this, but we need a conversation on these issues by Islamic intellectuals and scholars. And, and when they begin to have the conversation, we should not make them flee our Islamic societies, which is unfortunately the case in Pakistan, as you said, if you for happen people, because otherwise we're shutting ourselves to a, a cultural universe that is growingly disconnected with the aspirations, with the values and with the lifestyle and uh, systems of the modern world. It's a little difficult to disassociate what's culture and what's actually religious, for instance, something that I've never even questioned and I've been told repeatedly and I take it to be rule or law and that something that you've argued against is the idea of time, that the later ayats abrogate the older ayats. If they contradict what is later is correct because it corrects what happened before it. But you make the argument that that's not true. Well, I'm not the only person who says abrogation idea should be revisited and totally abandoned. Uh, it's a common view now, actually, among the more, let's say, modernist uh, interpreters of the Quran. Here's what happened. Uh, when Islam was born in Mecca, Muslims were a persecuted minority, as we all know. And uh, verses taught them about patience and, and to, to the pagans in, in Kafirun, in Surah Al Kafirun, the, the unbelievers. It says, lekum dinikum, lekum dinikum which means to you, your religion and to me, mine. So let the pagans have their own religion, but Muslims be able to have their monotheistic faith. Uh, and it told the prophet that you're not a guardian over them. So you're just a warner, just a preacher. These teachings were there. And when Prophet Muhammad, they still didn't allow him, right? I mean, that's the thing. If, if, if Mecca accepted those teachings, we would have a different history of Islam, I think. But still, because they because Prophet Muhammad offended their traditional deities and, and their religion, right? It was offensive speech. Islam was for them offensive speech. They didn't tolerate that. Muslims, they're persecuted Muslims. Muslims fled to Ethiopia and ultimately to Medina. By the way, why Medina welcomed them? Nobody actually speaks about that. Why the Medinans were open to welcoming Muslims. Do you have any idea about that? 
because they did not hold any political power and this was a potential way for them to gain prominence. Or they were just uh, nice people, Mustafa. Have you thought about that? Maybe they were just good people. <laughs> Maybe they were just good people, but there was something else. There were Jews in Medina. So they had seen monotheism from the Jews and they had actually admired it. Like they, from the Jews, they learned about belief in one God. It made sense to them. So uh, actually Ibn Ishaq says, God paved the way to Prophet Muhammad's Medina uh, Hijra because there were Jews there. So the presence of Jews in Medina actually helped Islam. And that, that's why they came and they actually made the first very good treaty with them, right? I mean, the Medina constitution, as we call it. Anyway, that's a minor issue. Then still, I mean, going to Medina didn't solve the problems because Muslims were plundered, their house were raided. Muslims began raids to uh, punish, to retaliate against that. That led to battles, we know. I mean, the, the, the 10 years of Prophet Muhammad's life led many dozens of uh, battles or raids or small skirmishes and a lot of military affairs. And there are verses in the Quran, there are verses in the Quran that guides these battles as well, right? Uh, especially in Surah Tawbah, that's one of the last surahs of the, the Quran. Uh, fight people from the people of the book until they pay the jizya and they're subdued, right? Now, there were other verses which says, to your religion, to be mine, but here it says, fight until they're subdued. So it's not, you still actually give them their religion, that's important, but you win over them and you win supremacy over them. And then there are, there's a verse in Teva 5, uh, which actually says, kill the polytheists wherever you find them. So unless they convert, so polytheism was not allowed. Now, what happened is that Islamic jurisprudence took the final verses in Medina about jihad, about war, actually katal is the right word here, war, it took these verses and used them to abrogate all the earlier verses about pluralism and toleration, about non-coercion and, and Prophet Muhammad not being a, a guardian, but just a warner. Uh, so therefore, all when we say la ikraf you know, they can you can sign, find text who says that's abrogated. Or most people say it's not abrogated for La'i Krafidin, but they say it's limited by this other verse, uh, just to not to force them to enter Islam. But there are verses, for example, uh, I just recited a verse uh, in the beginning of our conversation. Uh, uh, the truth is from your Lord, let anyone who want to believe it, believe it, let anyone who want to disbelieve it, disbelieve it. That is considered as abrogated by these war verses, verses of the sword. Now, my answer to this is, this is not a requirement of the Quranic text itself. The Quran does speak of abrogation, but it seems like God abrogating something, another existing religion with a new religion. It doesn't necessarily mean verses of the Quran abrogating each other. And even then, it is God's authority to abrogate things, not just jurists decide what, what abrogates what other. But this uh, abrogation doctrine became dominant. So it actually... Uh, pushed aside from Islamic jurisprudence what some of the key teachings uh, in, of, of the Quran that are that's about pluralism, that's about peaceful coexistence, that's about non-coercion, you know. Uh, and uh, luckily, you know, this abrogation doctrine has been questioned in the modern era. More and more people are saying that's not valid. Maybe just a few issues on like alcohol, a few issues they say there is abrogation, but not on these uh, big issues of uh, relations with non-Muslims. I think that's the right direction. I believe there's no abrogation in the Quran. There's taxis. There is specification. In a war situation, yeah, you 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 win the you fight the enemy until you subdue the enemy. That's what war is. But that's not a universal blueprint, right? In other in, with other people, you can make treaties and you can have peaceful relations in an egalitarian world. So the the verses which came in the context of a very deadly war situation isn't the outlook, universal outlook of Islam. But that was made so. And that was what, because we had empires fighting for constant conquest. I think that that was the context at the time. This is the problem with people on the internet taking things out of context. I think there's, uh, there's a verse that says Jews and Christians cannot be your friends. And it's posted everywhere as an example of how Islam is the enemy, whereas it's talking about a specific tribe. Not that I have any personal vested interests or uh, uh, to ask you this question, but don't you argue that there is no punishment for drinking in Islam? 
I'm not personally no invested punishment. in this question. I'm just generally asking. There's no punishment. There is no punishment in the court. I mean, it, it's a sin to get drunk. I mean, it's it's obvious. That, I mean, wine is probably there. And well, oh, this it was even discussed whether actually it's drinks other than wine do they become haram to at the point whether it make you drunk or not. That was even discussed in the Hanafi mm -hmm. school. But I'm not going to do it, say anything about that. I mean, people can make their judgments and follow what they think. But there is no punishment. Like the Quran gives punishment to certain things. There are other things the Quran defines as sin, as things Muslims shouldn't do, but doesn't bring a punishment for that in this world. And the things that the Quran punishes, the five famous hudud, these are all crimes in the sense that there's a victim, right? You kill somebody, you get punished. You still, you get punished because you are hurting somebody else. Zina, in Zina, you actually betray your spouse and you confuse the lineage. So that, that is a betrayal of the family trust. And, uh, and the false accusation of Zina, you ruin the life of, of a woman. So, but there are other things like the Quran says, don't gamble or don't drink, but doesn't bring punishments for those who do it. It's between them and God. So that's how I argue for making a distinction between sin and crime. All... Uh, crimes are also sins, but not all sins are crimes. Although Islamic jurisprudence brought criminal punishment for, for all of those. And that's why, that's why, you know, we have religious policing. That's why we have the Taliban kind of groups who, uh, you know, go around and uh, they think music is haram. So they will break your musical instruments or burn them or, you know, uh, punish you for, you, you know, having a video cassette or something. That was the 90s. Now they're saying that they will be a little nicer. We will see, but I think no, they just did that again. They just, there was this very recent, a uh, couple of weeks back, there were videos of them breaking musical instruments. Since you mentioned the Hajj for Zina, don't you think the Pakistani law is a fundamental misunderstanding of the Quran and Islamic law? Because the idea of the four witnesses is it's almost a crime for public fornication, which would be a crime in the US as well. If you're out on the street doing it, it's seen as public indecency. So if yeah. there are four witnesses, isn't the whole philosophy that? If it was being done publicly like this, that's a yeah. crime. But if it's being done in private, we somehow blame the woman. Or if the woman comes forward and says that I have been raped and there weren't four witnesses, she's blamed that you committed adultery still. So you go to jail. Don't you think it's a fundamental misunderstanding in Pakistan? It is, and I wrote about it. You should uh, check my book, Why as a Muslim I Defend Liberty, uh, which got published a few months ago by uh, libertarianism.org, which is a part of the Cato Institute that I'm working. And I there begin, I have a chapter. It's, by the way, freely downloadable. You can share links maybe with your followers. After. I, was, I was going to look for illegal links, so thank you for telling me. Yeah, so that book is freely downloadable, and it gives a small summary of some of the issues I'm discussing here today. Um, uh, I begin with the story of, I think, uh, Afran Bibi. Uh, she was a lady who was raped in a village in Pakistan, went to court, and she was pregnant. She couldn't prove that she was raped, but the pregnancy was taken as an evidence that she committed zina, and she was given the death penalty. Uh, that was in early 2000s, and then there was a big reaction against that, and ultimately she was saved. But uh that is actually the i there is a there's a problem of not being able to conceptualize rape as separate from zina in our islamic legal uh, tradition zina is the main issue so rape is defined as zina bil jabr that is forceful okay. like or enforced zina now the problem there is uh, first of all, there is no idea that the husband can rape the wife, which is a problem. So that's not even considered as a problem at all. Second, most if, if a rape victim comes, you treat the issue with the same legal tools of Zina. And you ask for four witnesses, right? Well, how can a woman show four witnesses against a man who raped her? But, uh, but if she gets pregnant without a husband, that becomes an evidence that she is... she. Uh, gets uh, punished that she she committed adultery so there has been these cases in pakistan in nigeria as well where a woman gets first raped then is gets a punishment for zina because evidenced by her uh, uh, pregnancy which is an incredible injustice i mean like astonishing jaw-dropping injustice right i mean but this happened because of this blind textualism the reason why four witnesses was wanted because 
it was to protect women. I mean, that you couldn't throw libels at them that so easily. But if you don't understand that, and if you confuse zina and rape as the same thing, whereas rape is a more serious crime, it's aggression, right? Uh, if you confuse these things and go with the same legal methods, you end up doing these things, and which was one of the dramatic, tragic outcomes of the Islamization of laws in Pakistan in, in, in the 70s. So uh, I would recommend checking that chapter because I studied that the topic of this confusion between zina and, and rape in, in, in Pakistan and elsewhere and the tragic consequences of that, which shows you that if you don't understand the intention of a law, if you blindly implement it and you think that you're doing God's work and you are zealous about it, you can really do terrible things thinking uh, you are the right, doing the right thing. I don't think it's ignorance. I think it's malice. It's it's patriarchy trying to protect itself. For just something that was being discussed recently by the federal Sharia court as well was can video evidence of a rape be admitted? There was video evidence. You could see it, but still uh, they were like, no, let's be literal about it. Uh, I know I've taken up too much of your time, but uh, Amar Rashid, a very good friend of mine, he was very curious about your thoughts. He's a huge fan of your work, uh, about your thoughts of Imran Khan and his experiment with Riyasat in Medina. So if we could get some thoughts on that, uh, and then we'll call it day. <laughs> You're welcome. Sorry, I didn't understand the last question. Uh, Imran Khan and his articulation of uh, his government and his state being Riyasat Medina. And I know you've researched Pakistan, you've worked a lot on Pakistan, so I'm sure you're well aware of what is happening and is there any reason for him to call what is happening Riyasat Medina? Well, I mean, I don't want to comment too much on Pakistani politics. Uh, despite everything, I think Pakistani, at least political sphere, is actually looking to me a bit less alarming than, than the Turkish seen today. I'm not speaking about Islamic law, but in terms of concentration of power in the hands of one person. So, um, I mean, I wish success for the Pakistani government in its endeavors, and I have nothing against. But uh, those examples like that, I mean, like Medina Constitution, I'm referring to that. Now, these are helpful when they are a source of inspiration, right? What we see in the Medina Constitution is that we see Prophet Muhammad making going there and making a treaty with Jews who are said who are given equal rights with Muslims, right? To you, your religion, to us, are we will pre pre defend the city, and you are one ummah with us, like one people with us. So there is the idea of a even a city state where the state itself isn't defined by Islam, the state is defined by this constitution and, and the two communities. So there's a great room of inspiration there. But this is not a full-fledged model to come and copy today, right? We should not forget that that unfortunately treaty collapsed in a few years. Jews were expelled from the city because they were in uh, cooperation, Muslims perceived that way at least, with the Meccans of Pag uh, with, the, with the pagans of Mecca. Uh, and Medina became a dominantly Muslim city. And, and it was guided by Prophet Muhammad. And Prophet Muhammad, let's not forget, that had an authority that no, no one can claim, right? All Muslims were obeyed, uh, obliged to obey him by faith, and they did willingly. We don't have a prophet. We don't have a leader like that anymore. We have scholars with different opinions. We have political leaders. So we can take some inspirations from the political model of Medina. I will be sympathetic to that. But we can see that maybe things, those ideas and those ideals have been better articulated in liberal democracies today, right? Where you have constitutions, detailed rights, individual rights, not just for tribes, but individuals, uh, strong guarantees of rule of law. Uh, and, and I think that that's why we should be able to combine such inspirations from classical sources of Islam with the modern accomplishments of today, right? And I think, for example, Turkey, my country, went forward when it headed towards the European Union and its criteria of uh, liberal democracy. I mean, President Erdogan was singing the praise, praises of Copenhagen criteria 10, 15 years ago when he didn't have full power and he was worried about the military. And, and those years were the years Turkey went better for everybody. Uh, what, once he felt secure, he forgot Copenhagen criteria and he just went back to his uh, ideological roots, whatever they are. It didn't work well. So I think what we should do is I respect in finding roots for 
uh, sources of good inspiration in Islamic history. We, we have them and, and, and I, I myself work on them. But this doesn't mean that we will find everything we need there. We should also be open to achievements of all humanity because humanity, God gave reason and conscience to all human beings. And that's, they, that's why they might have also have good ideas and develop. That's, that's why uh, early Muslim thinkers didn't shy away studying Plato and his political models, right? Plato was not the best one, actually, but, but it's what they had. So that's why Al-Farabi, you know, uh, wrote about that. And, and he influenced mainstream Islamic tradition as well. So yeah. th that's the kind of synthesis that we need. Maybe Plato is where Not Plato, but the modern thinkers of maybe today. maybe Plato is where Islamic totalitarian came from. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure and yeah. honor to talk to you. And hopefully we can bother you in a few months to do one more of this. Uh, I think we've largely spoken to a Muslim audience. If we can just end it with this to the non-Muslim audience and specifically to some Islamophobes who present this idea, especially on mainstream television repeatedly, that Islam and modernity are antithetical to each other and they can never be synthesized. Is there something to be said to people like that? Well, I think uh, the people that you call Islamophobes, and I'm sure there are people like that, what they're doing is to they're cherry picking all the troubling elements in the Muslim world today and saying that this is Islam, right? You bring Taliban, ISIS, Al Qaeda together and say, you see, this is Islam. Well, I'll bring you nice Muslims together and say this is Islam and it will look very different. It's a very complicated picture. One more thing. If you looked at Christianity in the 17th century, it wouldn't look very nice at all. You would say these Christians are anti-Semitic. They're killing each other. They're burning people at the stake because of their ideas. This is a terrible, intolerant religion. And you would say, actually, Islam is better because people were escaping from Europe to Ottoman Empire very often. Uh, that's Jews and also Jews. Unitarians. So, uh, but Christianity changed. I mean, it was a crisis in Christianity. Uh, today, I think it's a religion by and large. I mean, there are militant expressions of Christianity in Southeast Asia, in the Eastern tradition especially. But I think Western Christianity by and large made peace with, uh, let's say, human rights and religious freedom for everybody. It wasn't easy. The Catholic tradition actually was a bit belated on that. Uh, but, you know, in Islam, we are in the birth pangs of the same, tra same tra transition. And we should be critical. We should, there are lots to criticize. But as a Muslim, I'm proud of my faith. And I believe that uh, we will mature some of the illiberal authoritarian interpretations of our faith. And I think the people who look Islam from the outside, I would encourage them to see this diversity. And, uh, and also when they are alarmed about those troubling elements of Islam, and then they go support their own fascists, yeah. like Hindu militants uh, in India. Uh, wh wh who are they complaining about? And, and, you know, if they're doing the same thing, if they're similarly uh, channeling religious hatred, if they are worried about militant Muslims, they should uh, also stand up against the militants in their own midst. Absolutely. If uh, when you think of a Muslim, you think of a terrorist, but you don't think of Dave Chappelle, question your media and question your biases. Thank you so much uh, for all the work that you do. And thank you so much for coming on. It was an absolute Thank you. It's a pleasure. It's been a good conversation on uh, many topics. Hope it will uh, be uh, listened to certain people. And uh, let's stay in touch and with Jiva Pakistan and with my blessings and <laughs> allows to all Pakistani friends. Uh, uh, this, this I will crop out and post uh, on TikTok for it to go wide. Okay, great. Thank you, Pakistan Dosti. Take care. Okay, Everybody, thank you for listening. Assalamu alaikum.